So the recorder is on, and today's lecture is actually going to be quite important. So even if you cannot take you know, like full notes, you know, which I do not expect anyone to be able to, um, you know, just because you know when I write the sample programs, you know, it's going to be um, it's going to be overwhelming to try to copy everything. But since the lecture is recorded, that means you know what you do need to do is to write down the timestamp when I start to talk about you know, certain topics. All right. <clears throat> So what we are currently at, there are a few things that are kind of important. So let me turn off all the tabs that I don't really need. Okay, the first thing is I moved all the topics that relate to how to use the, uh, how to use LogiSim, how to run the program from the command line, how to trace the execution of the program, and, and also the tools that you need, like River Spider. I moved all of those into its own module. <clears throat> so, you know, TTP, ASM tools and techniques is a new module. So what, all I did was to kind of reorganize things a little bit. So this way, you know, everything that relates to how to use the tool is in one, it's in, it's in, it is in its own module. <clears throat> and then all the actual topic, you know, for the class, you know, are now you know, back into this particular module. So it's easier to find things this way, I think. All right, so what we're going to do today is to talk about you know, the caller call Lee agreement. Uh, particularly, we want to pay attention to how do we pass arguments to a subroutine or function that you're calling, and how do you pass a return value back to the caller. So that's going to be, be the focus of today's lecture. Today's lab does not involve those particular topics, so we are starting to stagger, which means um, the lab is usually on the topic that we talked about in a previous class. So this gives people an ex you know, a little bit of extra time to absorb the material before the lab actually try to engage you know, that mat material. <clears throat> so this is the, the focus of today's lecture, and I'll, I'll be writing sample programs you know, to illustrate these points. <clears throat> so the agreement is between the caller and the callee. The caller is you know, whatever code is that is making the call or invoking the function. Then the callee is the function that is being invoked or being called. So do we have any questions about the term of caller versus the callee? The code that is doing the call and also the function that is being called. Okay. So the agreement is mostly based on the stack. Okay. So this is one of the things that we have to kind of focus on is the stack is really important because this is actually how the caller and the callee communicate for the most part, okay? There's one little part that is not on the stack. So we'll get to that later too. All right, so from the caller side, when you're calling a function, if there are arguments in the call, then the arguments are pushed first, but in reversed order. So what that means is the last argument is pushed first. Okay, so if you have five you know, arguments, one, two, three, four, five, five is pushed first, four, and then three, and then two, and then one. So all the arguments need to be pushed first, and then we push the return address. So this is the last thing that we push on the stack before we continue execution at the subroutine. So the next one is to jump to the entry point of the callee, which is typically just a label of the same name in assembly code. When the callee is done, the callee should return to the instruction right after the JMPI instruction, okay? And if the callee returned a scalar value, so somebody asked about what is a scalar value in the Tuesday, Thursday class. A scalar value is basically anything that cannot be divided into smaller components. So a structure is not a scalar. An object is not a scalar. An array is not a scalar. A pointer is a scalar. An integer is a scalar, a dub, double is a scalar, a float is a scalar, a char is a scalar. So is that okay so far? Okay. So because you know, the term scalar is actually not unique to this class, I did not invent this term. So that means if you want to get a better understanding of what is a scalar type, you can actually just go online, do a Google search, C++ scalar type, and it would basically tell you everything that you need to know about the scalar type. Um, okay, so if there's a return value, it is going to be in register A. Okay, so there are four registers. Register A is the one that both the caller and the callee agree on and say, okay, if I'm expecting any return value, I will go find it in register A. 
the caller cannot assume the registers A, B, and C are preserved when a function is called. So that means the function can mess up the values of registers A, B, and C. You know, uh, the caller cannot expect anything to be preserved. If there are arguments, then the caller is, has the responsibility to clean up the stack so that the, the arguments will not be sitting on the stack anymore. So you know, because the arguments are pushed earlier by the caller, this also means that later on, the caller is also responsible not, to so, not so much to pop the arguments, but just to clean up you know, the arguments, which means you know, we claim the storage on the stack that were, used, be, that were being used for uh, the arguments. So I'll have examples to illustrate all of these things. So right now we are just kind of talking about this, and then we'll st start to get into some routines to you know, examples to illustrate these. So on the callee side, the function being called, at the entry point of the callee, the stack pointer is assumed to point to the return address because that is supposed to be the last item to get pushed on the stack before the jump to the entry point of the subroutine. So that means you know, the callee, the function being called, can assume the stack pointer points to the return address. If there are parameters, then the parameters are of higher addresses compared to the return address because of the way they are pushed. The first argument or the first parameter starts with the address immediately after, which means higher than that of the return address. The last parameter has the highest address and parameters are contiguous in TTP, which means we do not leave any space for padding, which is actually what you know, other processes would do. But because TTP is an 8-bit processor, we do not do any padding. <clears throat> On the callee side, additional stack space may be utilized, and there's no need to preserve the values of registers A, B, and C. So that means you know, this echoes you know, what we talked about a little bit earlier, that the caller cannot assume the preservation of registers A, B, or C, because the subroutine can do whatever it wants with the registers. At the exit point of the callee, if the callee has a scalar return value, use register A to store the return value. We talked about that already, but I mentioned it here again, because after all, you have to look at the agreement from both sides. So in this case, one side is the caller, one side is the function being called. The callee is responsible to pop the return address. So the return address, by the time we get back to the caller, would not be on the stack anymore, because the callee, the function, is responsible to remove that item from the stack. The callee uses the pop return address to return the, to the caller. That we talked about on Monday, okay? So on Monday, we only do a call and a return, but without any arguments, without any parameters, and we, without any return values. <clears throat> so are we doing okay at this point? We good? Okay. So I will, do, I will go ahead and write a few sample programs. <clears throat> to illustrate all of these points. So let me get to, oh, I don't have a command line interface that is of the right size. Okay, let me see which one is better. Nope. I think this one is good. Okay. Let me move that into your view. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is to write some C code. So this is not even TTP ASM code, but it will still illustrate the points. Um, we'll just go for return value.c, which is a really simple program. So the only thing it does, okay, we have <coughs> pound include stdint.h. I like to pound include standard integer.h because I want to be able to specify a return type of an unsigned A-bit integer because that's all we can do in TTP because it's an A-bit architecture. So u in a underscore t, <clears throat> and the function is, we'll just call it for f here. It has no parameters. And all it wants to do is to return the value of, let's say, 7, okay? And here's main. Main is going to call f and then return 0, okay? So you look at this program, it's like, oh, but tech, you're not even doing anything with the return value of f, so how can we show anything at all, okay? Well, we'll get to that point, okay? You know, this, is, this is the fun part of this exercise here. So gcc-g-o return value, return value dot c. 
<coughs> GDB return value. So now I can list the program, okay? Nothing too surprising here. I will put a breakpoint on line 11. So put a breakpoint on line 11, and I just run the program. So by the time I get to line 11, the function is called already, it also, ha also has returned. So we, do you remember how we are supposed to return a value, a scalar value from a function from the earlier discussion? How do we return a scalar value from a function? From the earlier part of the discussion, you know, what is the caller callee agreement when we have a scalar value to return? No. Register A, very good. Okay, so it's supposed to be in register A. So <clears throat> the x86 architecture has a register A, but it has many, many different names depending on how wide you want that your register to be uh, seen as. So what we do is do an IR, which is info register. And info register shows that your know, RAX, which is the 64-bit version of register A, has the value of seven. What is significant about seven in this particular sample program? How was F defined? It returns seven. So seven as a return value is indeed in register A. So that standard of using register A as to store the return value and pass the return value from the function back to the caller is not something that I invented. Okay, this has been a convention in most compilers, you know, since the good old days. In fact, I think in all C compilers, they all do it like this. So are we okay so far with this concept? Okay. So the first thing we want to do is, okay, how do we replicate this program in TTPASM? So it has the same effect. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so quit. And now I can do an nvim dash o return value dot c, which is our C program that we just saw earlier, return value dot TTPASM which is going to be the code in assembly. So um, I don't have anything to do on the left-hand side because you know, we are done with that program already. On the right-hand side, I'm going to write the TTP ASM equivalent code so that we do exactly the same thing. We start with the no op instruction because I want to preserve the ordering of the definition of the functions. So I have to always branch around the functions that are defined before main. So that's why we, have, we need a JMPI to main. It is nice to have this, it is not necessary, because you know, all registers start with a value of zero when the processor starts. So that means you know, LDI D0 is not really needed, but it's nice to have it here just so that we know that, oh yeah, yeah we, we know where the stack point is supposed to start with, okay? So instead of having it imp being implicit, it is now explicit. So this is F here. So as a function, and you know, it needs to specify a return value of seven. Well, that's pretty easy. All we have to do is to say LDI register A with seven. That's all it needs to do, okay? Because we know in this case, you know, it's just returning a constant of seven. There's no computation whatsoever needed. And then after that, we have to pop the return address. So the whole thing about popping and pushing, that was on Monday's lecture. I'm hoping all of you had have enough time to kind of review all that content because we need to build our new concept on top of what we talked about already. And that's going to be the case you know, all the way until the end of the semester. So that means you know, reviewing all the topics and make sure that you have a thorough understanding is very important after every single class. All right, so we're going to pop it, which means we do LD. I cannot use register A anymore because register A now has a special job of your know, being the return value. So I can use register B, and then I do an increment D because I'm popping, which means I'm on, I am not only copying the content of the stack to a register, but I also have to quote unquote deallocate that location by increasing the stack pointer by one. All right, so that's all F has to do. Main on the other hand has to call function F. So that means I need a label you know, to specify where the function is supposed to return to. 
So I would say this is the continuation point from calling F, okay? That's the name of the label. It kind of describes you know, what it is for. <clears throat> and we have to push it on the stack first. So in other processors, you know, we can probably some, do something like this. You push, continue from calling F, but DTP ASM does not support that. Okay, there's no push instruction, and you cannot push an immediate, you know, for sure. So we want to do this, but we cannot do it like this. So the only way we can do it is to LDI A with continue from calling F, and then do a decrement D to reserve a byte on the stack, and then STDA to store the value of A, which is the continuation address, to the location that I just allocated from the stack. This is pushing the return address. And then after that, I can just do a JMPI to the function, which is F here. So by the time I get back from the subroutine call, I have a return zero in the C code, but in assembly code, I cannot return to anywhere. So the only thing I can do at this point is to have a halt instruction to basically mean, okay, we are all done with this program. There's nothing else that we need to do at this point. All right, so are there any questions? <clears throat> Yes. Line seven? Line seven is retrieving the return address from the stack because part of the agreement between the call and the callee is at the entry point of the subroutine, the stack pointer points to the return address. Now, since your know, line six does not do anything with the stack pointer, so that means you know the stack pointer is still pointing to the return address by the time we get to line seven. So that will retrieve the return address from the stack to register A in this point, in this case. All right, and I forgot one thing that is important, okay, which is JMPB, okay, because if I don't do a JMPB, I can put the return address to register B, but I'm not using it. So that means you know, without a JMPB, the execution of the program would have continued into main, which is not what we want it to do. So the JMPB is also important in this case. So this entire sequence, okay, from line seven to line nine is something that we talked about on Monday. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a very important concept when we are talking about function calls and returning. So this is the kind of thing that we really have to kind of review and make sure that it is all understood before the next class. All right, so with the program kind of all done, we can go ahead and test it. So let me see where, oh, this is the perfect spot to do it already. So I am just gonna do, I, I will use Reefer Spider just to save myself some time. Question? Yep. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was just being overly sensitive to your hand gesture. It's like, okay, it looks like you have a question. Okay, maybe not. Okay, um, so this is called return value.ttpasm. Um, it does not exist. That's a very common thing that I do. You know, see this little plus here? It means the file has not been saved. So I just have to save it first. <clears throat> All right, colon W is to save it, and then go back to the other prompt. There we go. Yeah, this saves me a lot of time, you know, a lot of copy, paste, you know, and specifying how to import and stuff like that. But I can do it without you know, using this tool. It's just a lot more cumbersome. So now I can switch back to the assembler. Okay, so the assembler is right here. And now I can go to the analysis tab. And the analysis tab is kind of nice, you know, because you know, it shows us you know, how the program executed and what are the effects after executing every single instruction. So let's go, let's do a quick check, okay? Uh, we start with a no op instruction and then we initialize the stack pointer. The stack pointer gets a zero. We then continue execution at the label of main which is at location 0A. On that, at that location, we are loading A with the label value, which is 1,0 in hexadecimal. And then we reserve a byte on the stack because we're pushing the address of the return address on the stack. The stack pointer is now FF instead of 00. Then we store register A to where register D is pointing to. So this tells us that location FF is changed to the content of one zero, which is the return address. Now, how do we know that is the return address? We can check that too. We go to the assemble tab. We go to the label definition, which is all the way down here, so which means I have to scroll down a little bit. 
So you can see how you know, right below this label definition, the um, column W, which is the address, is exactly one zero. So this is how we can double check to make sure that is that really the correct return address? Yep, it is. One zero is the return address. So when the subroutine, when the function is done, this is where it has to go to continue execution. So now we go back to the analysis tab, continue. So once we have pushed the return address, we continue execution at the entry point of the subroutine. And in assembly language, it is a simple jump, okay? It's just a simply a jump instruction to the label F. Label F is basically a symbolic name for 0, 5 as a location. And that is where we get to the first instruction, which is just loading A with the value of 7. So A gets you know, a value of 7. And then we retrieve the return address from where the stack pointer is pointing to. The stack pointer is FF. So we go to location FF to retrieve the content at that location. And that turns out to be 1, 0. And then we store that to register B, because we don't want to overwrite <coughs> the return value of you know, that is already in register A. Then we increment the stack pointer from FF back to 0, 0. And then we do a JMPB instruction to continue execution at location uh, 1, 0. And at location 1, 0, we have a halt instruction. And there's nothing past this point because the halt instruction says, OK, you know, this is it. OK, you know, we are done with this program. So do we have any questions about the trace itself? The only new element that we have introduced compared to the Wednesday, uh, the Monday lecture is the return value. And the return value is just line six. Okay, we put whatever the return value is to register A before we return, that's it. Okay, that's how we return a value. Are we doing okay so far? Do they, do, are, are there any questions regarding the trace or the program that we saw earlier? questions all right are we sure there are no questions if you need more time to think about this you can just ask for more time that works as well so we are good okay all right <clears throat> so the next thing we're going to do is to introduce the concept of parameters and arguments so for this class, I'm going to do something different from the other class, which means you, know, you might want to check out you know, what I do with the other class, because the examples are slightly different, which means you know, it gives you another exposure to the same concept. So in this case, I'm going to say <clears throat> add. Okay? And you know, so I'm going to write the C code. Okay? The C code is going to be the, about the same thing. We include standard integer dot h, u in 8 underscore t, and I'll just call this you know, the sum subroutine, sum function, u in 8 underscore t, x u in 8 underscore t, y. <clears throat> and all it wants to return is x plus y. That's all. And then in main, we make a call to sum without storing the return value. And we can call sum with, I don't know, Let's try the 47 and 12, okay? And then return zero. This is the C code. So the first thing we want to do is to test the C code. And we want to basically make sure that by the time we get to line 11, the so-called register A, which is RAX, is going to contain the sum between 47 and 12, which is what, 69? And 69 in hexadecimal is what? Can we, do, can we do a base 10 to base 16 conversion without using a piece of paper or a calculator? How good is your mental math? 69 divided by 16 is what? What is the quotient and what is the remainder? Four with a remainder of five. Very good. So 4, 5 is the hexadecimal number that we're expecting in register R, A, X. On line 11, if I run this code in GDD, OK? So is that OK? Does everybody understand how we did the conversion? 
because in hexadecimal, the digit one is specifying the number of 16. Digit zero is specifying what is left over. So when you divide four, 69 by, six, by 14, four is the quotient. So that means you know, we have a four for digit one, but what is left over? Well, 69 minus 64 is a five. So five becomes digit zero because it's the left over in number in quantities of one in that case. Okay, <clears throat> all right. So we are gonna try this out. Okay, so we are gonna compile the code first. So I have to go back to the temp folder, push the temp. All right, so we do a GCC dash G dash O. This one is called, I think add. And then add.c is the source code name for in C. Um, nope, apparently I did not save the file. <laughs> yep, I did not save the file. Again, <clears throat> this is the only thing a GUI tool is gonna buy me is you know, when I hit build, it would make sure that I saved the file first. Yes? Um, yep, you're right. <laughs> I cannot, I can do the base conversion, but I cannot do the base 10 addition. That is, I would say a little bit embarrassing, but a little weird as well. But thank you, that's, that's correct. <clears throat> when you raise your hand, I was expecting you to ask me to check whether we are recording, and we are. <laughs> but that's good. You know, I really like you know, being reminded, it's just, it's just so that we don't miss it, right? Okay, so yep, it's 59. So what is 59 in hexadecimal? So you do the same thing. 59 divided by 16 is three with a remainder of, so three times 16 is 48, right? 59 minus 48 is 11. And 11 in hexadecimal is what digit? Hmm? B is correct, because A is 10, so B is 11. So we, we should be expecting three B instead. Okay, so I, I admit I made a mistake in my arithmetic, so it should be three B in register RAX after the program is done. All right, so let's do the compile again. GDB add. <clears throat> List the program, put a breakpoint on line 11, which is right after the call to sum. Run the program. Now we're at this point. We say print. Um, this time, since I know the name of the register, I just print the register. So it prints, when I say print the register, it printed in uh, decimal already. So 59 is correct. But if I want to print it in hexadecimal, I can specify the format, and it is 3D in hexadecimal. So this is how we can kind of really check everything that we did earlier. All right, so I'll be okay so far with the C code. If I go back to the C code, do we understand how we test it to make sure that the C code does what it's supposed to do to verify that you know the concept of returning a value in register A is not something that Tag invented. This is actually what compilers do. Okay, it's a convention that the that most compilers use in uh, in C and C plus plus. So are we good so far? All right. So now we write the assembly code, okay? So this time it is a little bit interesting. Uh, the, I I'll do the boring part first, okay? The boring part is really just the usual stuff that I do. Go to main, and then in main, <clears throat> we have to call the subroutine. So this time main has something interesting too, because I have to push the arguments, okay? So everything is done on the stack, okay? The arguments are pushed on the stack, the return address is pushed on the stack and so on. So what should I push first, okay? I got three items that I have to push. The return address, the first argument, which is 47, the second argument, which is 12. What should I push first? Do you remember from the earlier discussion what needs to be pushed first? The last argument, which is gonna be 12. Very good, okay, so excellent. We have to push 12 first. So once we know what to push, you know, the code to do it is really kind of boring. Okay, we put 12 into a register first, decrement D, allocate one byte on the stack, and then store to whatever D is pointing to, you know, the content of A, which is 12. So that pushes you know, the value of 12 on the stack. And then we push 47. Okay, about the same, you know, not really exciting here. 
and then we push the return address. So this time I'm going to use a slightly different way to specify the return address. <clears throat> it does involve you know, the understanding of the dot notation. So we'll go ahead and you know, we'll just say something like this, okay? We don't know what it is supposed to be yet, okay? And then we do the usual stuff, injection in D, ST, D, A over here, and this is my JMPI to sum, okay? So the question is, if I have some instruction here, I would just put a no op here as a, as a placeholder. So if I want this, you know, whatever here, to specify the address of the no op instruction, but without the use of an explicit label, how can we do that? Well, <clears throat> I thought about this you know, when I was making the assembler. So I have a little thing called a dot notation. So the dot, a single dot, is basically the address of the instruction that a dot is on, you know, on the same line. So that means you know, this dot on line 14 is the address of the LDI instruction. You go like, okay, but how is that going to help? Because now I can calculate the address of the no op instruction here by counting. So I, I can do the counting by hand. The LDI instruction is going to have two bytes, right? Because we have the, the op code followed by the immediate constant. So it's going to take up two bytes. So from the perspective of the dot notation, those two bytes would be dot plus zero and dot plus one. Decrement D is a one byte thing, so that would be dot plus two. SD is, ST is also a one byte thing, so that would be dot plus three. JMPI is going to take up two instructions, or two locations, I should say, two locations. The first one is the opcode, which is four zero in hexadecimal. The second one is the actual sum, or the label, the value of the label sum. So it would take up two bytes. So that would be dot plus four and dot plus five. So that means the no op instruction is going to be dot plus six. Exactly. So we'll put a dot plus six here. Except the assembler also does not accept in fixed notation. It accepts what we call the RPN or reverse Polish notation, otherwise known as a post fixed notation. So the way you do it, you, you specify the values and then you specify what to do with the values. Okay? <clears throat> so let me point out to the document where you can find this type of information. <clears throat> they are all in the assembler manual. Um, so if I were to go back to the processor folder, the manual for the assembler actually describes the, in, the postfix notation and also what the dot is representing. So you can, you can kind of dig through this. You know, I'm pretty sure it mentions that, okay? So, all right. So the nice thing about this is I don't need a label anymore. I don't need a label definition just to specify at when the function is done, where do we go to continue execution? I don't need that anymore. <clears throat> all right, so getting back to this point here. So whatever I specify here is going to be the first instruction after the function is done, okay? So we get back to this point. So in the previous program, we got nothing to do. But in this program, we do. Because as a part of the agreement, the caller called Lee agreement, um, we push the two bytes on the stack, which means you know, they have to be cleared or they have to be deallocated by someone. Who is responsible to deallocate the arguments? It will be the caller, not the call Lee. Okay, so the caller is responsible to deallocate the arguments. So now would be a good time to do it. Now, do I need to pop the arguments you know, into some place? Do I have use of the constant 47 and 12 now that the function is done? No, we don't need we don't need that anymore. So that means there's no need to do LD anymore because your know, LD is only useful. When you say, oh, that location in the, on the stack, I need to know that value. I, I need to retrieve that value. I don't need that anymore, okay? The function's already done. So that means the only thing I need to do is to increment the stack pointer twice in this case. The first time we increment, it is deallocating the 47. The second time I increment, it is deallocating the 12 on the stack because I don't need those things anymore. <clears throat> and after that, we are all done. You know, we just put a halt here. 
all right? So I intentionally did not put in any comments into this code because you know, this would be a good exercise for you guys to do after class, is not to listen to the lecture again, but to go through the program, go through the caller callee agreement document, then you use what you understand with that doc document to basically comment this code here and basically say, what is this? What are these three instructions doing? Uh, you can group things into like six line six to eight is doing one thing. It's doing the push twelve. Okay, uh, line twelve, line ten to line twelve, they're pushing the forty-seven. But why are we doing it? Because those are arguments. But why are we pushing those in that in that particular order? Because we push the last argument first. So when you write the comment, <clears throat> you are, it's different from listening me talking about it because you know, the listening process in your mind, in your brain is different from the writing process. So when you write the comment and think of how to write it out in your own words, that gives you a second chance to let the concept you know, sink in. So that is why it is important to take notes, not so much in the class, but when I give you sample programs like this, it is also going to be another chance for you to take notes. The program is not super long, so you can retype it if you want to. You know, as you type, then you can also kind of add your own comments. So, but the first thing we want to do now is to test run the code and see whether register A ends up with a value of 59 or 3B in hexadecimal. Um, and we also want the stack pointer to be quote unquote balanced which means it should go back to zero, zero. Okay, register D should go back to zero, zero to basically indicate that the stack is once again empty, just like when it started. All right, so are we good to go? Because if there are questions about the code, we should answer those questions first. I should answer those questions first. Any questions? Can you explain the dot notation again? Sure, so the dot notation is the the dot is representing the address of the instruction on that same line. So in this case, you know, the dot is representing whatever address the LDI instruction has. So when you say, you know, uh, so basically in infix notation, this would have been dot plus six. So dot plus six is six bytes away from the LDI instruction. And that turns out to be the instruction right after the JMPI instruction, which is also where we need the function to return to. So I can do the quick counting again. LDI takes two bytes, so that would be byte zero, byte one, byte two, byte three, byte four, byte five, and this is byte six. All right, <clears throat> so let's go ahead and you know, test the program in our simulator. simulator. So pop D to this tool, and this is add.pppasm. Uh oh, uh, it did not assemble correctly. <laughs> so I can go to the assembler to find out why it is not assembling correctly. Go to the source tab, which would include the errors here. Oh, okay, it's complaining. I did not write some. Okay, the function is not written yet. Okay, okay, this, but this is good. Okay, I like this. I like this problem, so to speak, in quotes, air quotes because it gives me an, a chance to talk about how to write your programs. So what I want to do is to say, let's just go here and we have some, and it's not gonna do a single thing. Halt. We go like, but heck, that's not what it's supposed to do. I know it's not what it's supposed to do. But by doing this, I can take a snapshot of what the stack looks like at the entry point of some. I can know exactly what is on the stack. I know what the stack point is pointing to at the entry point of the subroutine. So it is not a bad experiment to do, you know, just so that we can visualize and take a look at things. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. So we'll go ahead and resubmit the program because I did forget to define sum as a label. I did not, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. There we go. All right. So we go back to the, assemb uh, the assembler. We go to the trace or the analysis tab. And by the time we get to the halt instruction, which is on line 
5, which is the entry point of the subroutine, let's check out what is on the stack. How do we know what is on the stack? Everything that you write to the stack is going to be in column C. So you focus on column C. And the way we look at column C is we know location FD is a 1, 4, location FE is a 2F, and the location FF is a 0C. What are those things? <clears throat> what is 0C in decimal? 12. That's 12. Oh, that's our second argument, right? Okay. What is 2F in decimal? 2 times 16 plus 15. 47. Why would we have a 47? Oh, right, because the 47 is our first argument. Okay, cool. And what about 1, 4? 1, 4 is a little bit harder because it's not one of the constants in the program. But if you look at the continuation point, so this is also where you can double check to make sure that the dot notation is correct. Okay, so we go to the assemble tab this time. We go to the assemble tab, and then we are trying to find the point where it's supposed to return to. This is the JMPI instruction. The subroutine, the function, is supposed to come back to the instruction right after the JMPI instruction, which is at location 1.4. Okay, so location 1.4 is indeed the correct place to return to. But this is also a place where you can double check and make sure that the math turns out to be correct. Because the LDI instruction starts at location 0E. So then you just add 6 to 0E. Zero 0E zero e plus 6 is 1.4 in hexadecimal. You can double check all that math with the calculator. But that's how we did the calculation. That's why we specified a 6 as an offset from the location of the LDI instruction to specify the return address. So we good so far with that dot notation? I know the uh, RPN thing you know, looks a little bit weird. Okay, and there are ways to convert from infix notation to postfix notation. I can talk about that maybe in a different class, but right now we just need to say dot six plus is the same thing as dot plus six, except the assembler can only recognize and parse um, RPM, which is reversed Polish notation. Yep. For the same reason that I do, that I do a lot of things, laziness. <laughs> because parsing RPN is significantly significantly easier compared to parsing infix notation. So, um, and I'm not the only one, so I can actually you know use that as an excuse too. RPN is used by quite a few commercial entities because it is easier to parse. The first one is HP. You go like HP. They used to make calculators. So if you check with your parents or possibly your grandparents and ask, so what kind of scientific calculator did you use when you were in college or during your entire career? They will say, oh, we use HP calculators. They used to make calculators. But those calculators do not have parentheses. So when you want to enter a complex expression, RPN is what you need to do. So that's one. The second commercial entity that makes use of RTN is Adobe. Adobe, you go like, Adobe, how, how, what does Ad Adobe have anything to do with RPN, which is a way of expressing an you know, equation or you know, a formula? Can anyone guess what kind of standard Adobe is famous for? Acrobat Reader, what does it do? What does Acrobat do? It reads PDF. Very good. Okay. So can you guess what is inside a PDF? Inside the PDF are instructions to draw stuff on a piece of paper or on the screen. So typically you have to say, okay, draw a curve like this here, a straight line over here, put a character like that over here, and so on. But other times it has calculations to do. Okay. We need to do a you know, calculation, you know, add this to this, and so on and so forth. And can anyone guess what type of expression it uses as a part of PDF? Reversed Polish notation. And before PDF, okay, this is way before your time, so you may not know it. Uh, before PDF, there's a standard called PostScript. Has anyone heard of the standard called PostScript? P-O-S-T, PostScript, S-C-R-I-P-T. 
it's a quote unquote printer language. So it was the PDF at the time. So you basically send postscript description of what you want to print out to a printer, and then the printer will render all the dots accordingly on the piece of paper. So postscript gets its name of postscript because because it uses postfix notation, exactly. So the postfix notation thing is weird for a lot of us because our mind have been poisoned by infix notation ever since elementary school. <laughs> but it makes perfect sense in computer science because postfix notation is a lot easier to parse, syntactically speaking. Yes? Um, because you don't need the concept of a, you don't need to match parentheses for one thing. So that's why your XP calculators never had open and close parentheses because they're not needed. Okay, so since you asked that question, and we have time, I'm gonna give you an, uh, an example, okay? So I know this is a little bit out of the scope of this class, so you know, the rest of you who are not interested can just ignore this. But I do want to talk about it a little bit. Um, no, there we go. All right, so we're going to start with some complex you know, equation here. So a plus b, the whole thing times c, and then you take this entire thing, and then you add d to it, and then you divide this entire thing <laughs> by uh, e plus f. Okay. So this is an infix notation, which means the operator is between the values that it's supposed to operate on, okay, which is what we're used to. The infix notation of this, okay, I can do it by hand. So a, b plus, which is the a plus b, c times, so that is the entire, the product here, and then d plus, which is you know, the entire numerator of the division. So at this point, I say, okay, I'm done with the numerator, but I'm not ready to do the division because I haven't specified the denominator yet or the divisor yet. So now I do the divisor. So the divisor is just E, F plus. So at this point, there are two values. One value is coming from the earlier part of the notation. So this part is giving me the numerator or the uh, dividend. This part is giving me the divisor, which is also the denominator. So I have two values now. Now that I have two values, I can now say, do a division with those. And as you can see, there's no need to use parentheses. And it's a lot easier to parse because the operators also do not have intrinsic priorities anymore. You don't have to remember, oh, addition always happens after multiplication in the absence of parentheses. You don't, you don't have those rules anymore because you know, that's, it's, it's easy. So if you think, you know, oh, but I can't really look at the first one and you know, come up with the second one, that's only because you have not been exposed to the concept. If this, if this is how they teach expressions in elementary school, you would not have a problem coming up with and understanding the postfix notation. Is that okay? I think between your know, pushing binary numbers and postfix notation you know, into elementary school, I can be a very successful politician. I think I'll get a lot of votes. I'll get the votes of about 0.5% of the population, the super geeky part. The, the other 99%, 99.5% of the population will not understand the ballot at all. They look at this and go like, okay, this guy is pushing for binary numbers and postfix notation. Have no idea what either stands for. I'm just going to ignore that page. Keep flipping. <laughs> this is also my plan for world peace because you know, when people switch over to postfix notation and binary numbers, they won't have time for conflicts anymore. They will just be spending time to look at this and go, like, what does this mean? All right, so getting back to uh, the assembly code, okay. <clears throat> So we go to the analysis tab again, okay? So we push those three things on the stack. So this is how you can, you can tell by the time we get to the entry point of the subroutine, the stack pointer is FD, 
and the location of the has the return address of 1.4. So you can confirm all of this stuff here before you go any further. Because going any further without confirming what is on the stack, that we have the right things at the right place on the stack, it's just a waste of time. All right. So now we go back to the code because we are not quite done with the subroutine. So we now go back to the subroutine and continue with that work. <clears throat> Is what do we do at this point? Okay, so we, we can take out of the, uh, the halt instruction. All right, so we need to get to X first, okay? So what we need to do is to say CPR CD. So what this does is, you know, C equals to D. That's all it does, okay? The value of D is copied to register C. So that means both register C and register D at this point point to the return address, okay? They're duplicates. And then the next thing we do is, so the idea behind this is you don't want to increment the stack pointer until you are 100% sure that you don't need what it is pointing to anymore. So the stack pointer is now pointing to the return address. Do you think we still need the return address? Yeah, we need that to return. So that means do not change, do not increment the stack pointer because you know, the basic rule is anything that is lower than what the stack pointer is pointing to is susceptible to the corruption of gremlins. Yes, you heard me right. Okay, the mythical creatures you know, that can cause problems. Okay. I'm not going to explain why that is the case just yet, okay? But just we'll, we'll just make the assumption that anything that is below where the stack pointer points to, but above the last instruction of the program, is susceptible to some magical, mythical creature, and the content of that part of RAM can be changed without you knowing it, okay? All right. So now what we do is we, okay, so this is also a good time to basically say what is C. C is essentially the address of the return address on the stack, okay? So now we say, let's increment it, okay? See what happens. So when you increment C, it would be the address of whom? So remember what the stack looks like, okay? We have the three items on the stack right now. We have the second argument, the first argument, and then the return address. I just moved the pointer to one location higher than the return address. So it's the 47, which is the second, uh, which is the first parameter, which is X, right? So we just say, okay, so it is the address of X. So when we are adding here, are we adding the address of X and the address of Y, or are we adding the content or the value of X versus Y? The value, right? So how do I go from the address of X to become the value of x. Which instruction do I use? So we need an instruction that is reading from RAM, but it's not, um, re it's not getting a constant value. It is getting a value that some register is pointing to. Load, okay, very good. So LD is the instruction. So this is also why you know, by this time it is really important that we understand you know, all of these instructions, all the opcode and all the mnemonics, because load is what we need. So we just say load um, into register A, whatever register C is pointing to. Yes, I kind of forgot, you know, that was my mistake. There we go. So at this point, C of register A has the value of parameter X, okay? Oh, okay, so we can do this again, okay? So at this point, what do you think C is? It's the address of? Hmm? Y, okay, because Y is pushed first. It is one byte higher than X, okay? So register C is now, you know, the address of Y. So that means, oh, I can put it into another register. Okay, let's put it into register B. So B is now Y. Oh, now that we have register A having X, register B having Y, we can just add those two. And I'm gonna add these you know, using add AD. So A is now register A, is now X, uh, X plus Y, which is our return value. Mission accomplished, okay? So now we just have to do the usual return stuff, which is uh, LD, B, D. I can use register C too if I want to, but yeah, I don't have to. <clears throat> Increment D to deallocate the return address. 
and then JMP, JMPB to continue execution at the return address, which is going to be back down here at the location, you know, corresponding to line 30 this time. All right, so I'm going back to uh, the sum function and see if there are any questions at this point. This time I did give you all the comments, but you might still want to kind of go through that and relate the comment to the caller call Lee agreement, okay? Why at one particular point? Okay, I'll give you an example. Why on line eight, okay, um, register C is going to have the address of X. Which part of the agreement you will explain that? Well, that's because you know, we push all the arguments first, and then when we push the arguments, we push the last argument first. And then the return address is the, is the last thing that we push, so it has the lowest address. So you want to be able to go through you know, these lines, I would say from line 6 to line 11, and be able to relate each and every single line to the caller callee agreement. That would be a good exercise to do. Alrighty, so let's go back and check whether the program is doing what we think it should be doing. So make sure we save it first, okay? And then we go back here, we ask it to, let's run and trace it again. All right, so now we go back to the assembler, go to the, oh, we are already there. So we are just continuing from where we left off last time. <clears throat> um, zero 05 is the entry point of the function. So the first thing we do is we do a CPR, which is basically just copying one register to another register. So register C is now the same as register D, which is FD. And then we increment C, which is FE. But you can also see from earlier, FE is where the 47 is. So we, when we retrieve from that location, it is no surprise that register A becomes you know, 2F because of the LD instruction. And then we add one to the uh, register C again. It is now FF. But we also recall earlier that location FF has um, 0C, which is the 12. Okay? So when we do a, in, a load into register B, we get 1C into register B. It was 1C because... Hmm, that doesn't seem right. Yeah, that doesn't seem right. Okay, so I made a mistake somewhere. This is great. The program is not working the way it's supposed to. So did I push? Oh, I know what the mistake is. I keep messing around with register C, but what register did I use for the load instruction? You can see it here. I used register D, which I never changed this entire time. So I was loading the return address into the register B, and so it's incorrect. Okay? So this is also a really good, interesting moment because I made a mistake. So the question is, how did I spot the mistake to begin with? because I knew what should be in register B, because according to this, register B should be the value of parameter Y. Parameter Y is 12, which is 0C, and yet it is putting 1C into register B. That is not 12. So this is the spot where I go like, okay, I know something is not right. I made a mistake somewhere, but everything earlier seemed to check out. So that means you know, whatever is gone, has gone well, has to be that particular instruction here. So I can just check the instructions and go like, oh, okay, I'm supposed to be using register C instead of register D you know, on the right-hand side. Is that okay? <clears throat> so this is my process of debugging a program. I track down the program. I anticipate what the program is supposed to do along every single step. When the trace shows me something that does not match my expectation, I would stop right away. It's like, okay, I know something is wrong, and it's probably the previous step because you know, I track every single step, and everything seemed to be matching until this point. So that means you know, when I debug my program, 
I can track down and say, okay, I don't have to check the entire program because I already know the earlier part of the program is functioning correctly. This is the only one that is incorrect because I used the wrong register. All right, so that means you know, to go back to the source code, I can just change you know, the one that is wrong, which is this one here. I use register D. I was supposed to be using register C. Save the file again, <clears throat> and then go through the same process, run the program again, and this time, you know, it should be a zero C that is loaded into register B. All right, so we get back here, and you can see the trace you know, basically changed right away to a C, and then we add those two, it becomes zero, it becomes three B, which is our 59, and then we return, <clears throat> We increment the stack pointer twice to get rid of the arguments that are sitting on the stack right here, you know, incrementing twice. So by the time we get to the halt instruction, register D has a value of zero, zero, which is good, you know, because the stack is back to being empty again. But the last update to register A was a 3B, which is the correct result. You know, we get our 47 plus 12 back. All right. So are there any questions about this entire process? It's not really just the concept of the caller callee agreement, but also how to write the code, you know, like you know, finish half of the code, okay, put a halt at the beginning of the function so you can check stuff out. And also, you know, just checking out every single instruction and make sure that we see the correct outcome. And if you see something that is not the right outcome, then you stop right away. It's like, okay, I made a mistake at or before this point. Now it's time to kind of backtrace it to see if you can find out where it went wrong. Okay, are there any questions? Yes? Register C is not a stack pointer. It is just a copy of the stack pointer so that I can move around to look at stuff. Okay, remember what I said earlier? Everything that is below where the stack pointer points to is susceptible to be overwritten by gremlins. M mythical, naughty creatures. Huh? There's no like, set reason why it can't. There's a reason. The reason is interrupts. And since I haven't really talked about interrupts, and that is by itself a half hour topic. So right now we just kind of say that, okay, do not move the stack pointer up unless you know whatever it's pointing to right now can be lost. Since I cannot lose the return address, so I better not mess around with that yet. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, so that's about you know, the concept that we want to introduce in today's class. I'm just gonna take roll so that we have a little bit of a break and then we can come back and talk about hmm, maybe recursion. So let me switch to the road taking part. Today is, okay, where? Is that the right class? Yep, it is the right class. And all right, keep going. Today is the 15th. So let me. It doesn't let me turn on the visibility. That's weird. Okay, give me a second. There we go. Okay, so now we can change that. Okay, so now you have visibility. And the passcode is GDB. <clears throat>
Do we have any questions about the trace? So let me go back to the trace so that you can keep an eye on the trace itself. All right, so how do we study this? Okay, you know, in other words, are there other ways to look at this so that it's a little bit more intuitive? The answer is there are ways to look at this, but it's not gonna be easy for me to convey it on a piece of paper. So what you can do is to basically use your own spreadsheet, okay? To keep track of what is at the locations, FF, FE, and FD. Every time we push something, you kind of update, you know, that particular table, and then every time you change the stack pointer, you also move the pointer around. So it's not gonna be something that's easy to be done on a piece of paper, because it's more like an animation of you know, how things change when you execute the program. On the other hand, when you look at the trace and entire trace like this, this is also something that you can just go look at this and then try to explain what is happening with every single instruction. Um, I see that nobody is looking at the spreadsheet because I think there's no one here. Okay, so um, if you sign in to uh, Google Sheets right now, you can go to the same spreadsheet, which is the same assembler that I have been using all semester long. So what you can do is to make a copy. It has the right source code, it has the right trace already, which means you know once you make a copy at this point, um, you can use it as studying material because it has the source code, it has the trace, you know, everything is already explained as it is. So when you combine this with the recording, recorded uh, video of this class, then you can reproduce everything that we were talking about today. <clears throat> I don't intend to change this you know, further today, but I do want to talk about recursion. So let me take a look at the time. Yeah, we got 10 minutes. We got enough time to do it. <clears throat> All right, so let me go back to, so I'm leaving the assembler alone, so you have more time to sign in and make a copy of that sheet. But you know, what I'll do in class is I'm gonna start with another program. So nvim-o, uh, we call this one sum, sum.tttasm, and once again, we have pound include standard integer dot h, u in eight underscore t. Um, I'll call this sum again, u in eight underscore t n. And then we have the usual main, which calls you know sum. Let's say with a value of three, return zero. So this time the challenge is sum itself. It's going to say return. If n is zero, go ahead and return zero itself. Otherwise, return a recursive call of sum with n minus one plus n, like that, okay? So we want to focus on just sum this time, okay? So I'm not gonna give you the entire program because I don't intend to run this program through the assembler because I want to give you guys time to make a copy of whatever is there already at this point. <clears throat> All right, so now the question is, what do we do about this? Okay, this is recursive, which means your know, sum is calling itself, right? So most of the time people overthink these things and end up you know, getting confused because they're overthinking. So let me just kind of show you the code of this particular sum. It also helps to give, you a, you know, to give yourself a map of what is on the stack. So we, can, we know that n as a parameter is here and then the return address is gonna be right below that, okay? and that is also where the stack pointer is pointing to. So it's a good idea to kind of have a pictorial representation, even though it's in text, so that you can kind of look, okay, I know what is on the stack right now. The stack pointer points to the return address, and then one byte above that is gonna be the parameter n. All right, so the first thing we need to do is to figure out the ordering of how to get this done. So Ultimately, we want to return a value, but we are so far away from that point, we don't have to worry about it just yet. The first thing we need to do is not to evaluate zero, is not to evalu evaluate the recursive call. We just want to see if n is zero at this point, which means I need to get back to the value of n. So I can use the same trick that I did earlier, copy register D to register C, um, and increment your register C so that it is now the address of n. 
and then I can load it into a particular register. I can put it into register, say A, doesn't really matter at this point. So I'm just gonna give you some really sparse you know, comment here that register A is parameter N at this point. Now I need to know whether it's a zero or not. But I don't have to do a compare. So do, do you remember a shortcut trick that we can do to see whether a register is zero or not? We have to use the zero flag, okay, very good. But how do we influence, how do we change the zero flag according to the value of register A? Instead of a compare, there's another way to force the content of a register through the ALU, yep. Yep, and AA, okay, so and AA is the way to force you know, the content of register A through the ALU, and therefore either setting or clearing the Z flag depending on whether register A is zero or not. So if it is zero, we go to a place and it is no recursion at that point, okay? So I just call that point return zero because that's what we're gonna do. So return zero is here. Otherwise, if we continue, this is where we have to do the recursive call. Recursive call, yeah, okay. So after the recursive call, we want to branch around to end the function, so end sum, and end sum is another label that I will put here. This is where we just do the usual return thing, which is LDBD, increment D, JMPD. All right, so when we get to return zero, do I have anything to do? You know, which means you know, on line 16, I'm supposed to say, oh, maybe load LDIA with a zero, but do I need it? How do I get to return zero? Return zero, I get there only because the JZI instruction decides to go there. But why would the JZI instruction go to return zero? Because register A is already a zero. So I can do a LDIA with zero, it will be redundant. I don't need it. So the big question is, what do I do here? Okay, the recursive call, which is corresponding to the else portion of the ternary expression. So I'm gonna focus on calling sum first. So now the big question is, but tech, we are already in sum, and if we are calling sum from within sum, how do we do that? The same thing that we do from any other place, okay? You push the arguments in a reverse order, you push the return address, when you come back, you clean up after yourself, clean up after the, the arguments, that's it. It's the same thing. So that means at this point, what I need to do is I need to calculate n minus one first. n is already in register a, so that means your know, decrement a is going to make a equal to n minus one. I, did, I, mean, I can push it now on the stack. So decrement d st da, which pushes you know, n minus one on the stack. And now I can push the return address. So you know, using the earlier trick that we learned, we can just say, oh, dot six plus, decrement D, oops, decrement D, <clears throat> and then we do a STDA, and then JMPI to whatever function we're calling, it just so happens to be the same one that I'm in. Is that okay? In other words, the caller callee agreement does not change when it is a recursive call. We do exactly the same thing, okay? So I hope this really helps to clarify some of the myths you know, surrounding recursion because you know, recursion is difficult to understand when you cannot see the stack itself. You cannot see that, oh, we're just pushing another thing on the stack and that's why the, each invocation is completely independent from the other invocations. So after we come back from the caller, you know, from the call, uh, we have to increment uh, D to clean up after the stack. So now register A has the re result of the recursive call. So we have to add N to it. Now you can say, oh, but that's easy because register C is still pointing to N. That is not true anymore. Why? Do you remember which caller callee agreement is gonna say, no, you cannot trust that re register C still contains the address of N. Which part of the agreement invalidates the assumption.
the callee, whoever you're calling, has no obligation to preserve registers A, B, or C. So that means you cannot count on register C still having the value that it had before, which is the address of N. So I have to recompute it, okay? Which is okay, it's not a big deal. So we just do the same thing, CPR, CD, increment C again. So now, you know, oh, let's keep saying one thing and doing another. So now register C is once again the address of N. So we now we do LDBC. I cannot use register A anymore because register A is the return value of the recursive call. So I have to use a different register, which is register B. So now that your register B is N, register A is the return value of the recursive call. I can add those two, add AB, and now we are done. We can go to the end of the subroutine, and that's how we can do the recursive call. <clears throat> All right, so I cannot show you how the code works you know, in this case, you know, because I don't want to clobber uh, the spreadsheet that is already in the assembler, so that you, know, you, can, you have, that will give you some time to kind of make a copy for yourself. So maybe next class on Monday, we can go through this code and make sure that this does what it is supposed to, and how to test this code in the C version, because you know, the testing in the C version can also give you some extra tools for not only this class, but also for CISP 430, where you have to write recursive your functions. Let me look at the time. Oh, we got two minutes. That's plenty of time. Let's let's do the uh, <clears throat> let's test the C code because you know that does not clobber the uh, assembler. Okay, so we go to push the temp gcc dash g just dash o. This is called what was it again? I cannot remember the name of the function. Okay, I can take a look at this. Sum, okay, this is sum. Sum.c, and then we gdb sum, list the program, put a breakpoint on line three, put a breakpoint on line 11, run the program. So gdb is really helpful because every time you stop <coughs> at the entry point of sum, it would not just tell you that, oh, you're on line five and we have a breakpoint. It would even tell you about the parameter of that specific call. So you can see how we started off with n being three, n being two, n being one, n being zero. So this is where the recursion is going to end. But what about, where are the other invocations? Okay, how do I visualize that? There's a, um, there's a, uh, command called backtrace, which, which can be abbreviated as BT, it shows you how you got here. This shows you that main on line 10 calls sum. Sum on line 5 is calling sum. Sum on line 5 is calling sum. Sum on line 5 is calling sum. This is called frame 0. So frame 0 is referring to the most recent invocation of the function. So this is the other thing that we can do. I know we are out of time, but I can do this. <clears throat> we can show, you know, what is the address of n of, at frame zero? Because by default, you're always at frame zero. So you can look at this and go like, oh, okay, it ends with EDC. And then the other thing we can now do is to say, I want to know what is sum in frame one. So you can say frame one, which means we're changing the context of the debugger to the caller of sum, which is sum itself, but it's a different invocation, and because it's a different invocation, n has a different address. So we can say print the address of n again, and you can see how this time it is ending with efc instead of edc. The last frame has a lower address compared to the previous frame. So this is consistent with what we talked about. Because, you know, okay, which part of the caller callee agreement can explain this? The, low, the parameter of the more recent invocation has an address that is below the same parameter of the caller, you know, of, this, of, of the same function. We push arguments on the stack. Okay, so this, okay, the C example actually illustrates the same concepts that I've been talking about with a caller-callee agreement, 
It's just that it's a little bit easier to work with because you can use GDB. And if you have not taken CISP 430, this, the use of BT, the use of your breakpoints, they are very useful for debugging recursive functions. Because otherwise, you have no idea which invocation you're in and how you got there. This can basically give you all the tools to basically diagnose your program and understand how did I get here? Okay, you might have 20 invocations below this, but you can go back to every single one of those invocations and know how you got there to be in it. So I'm going to end the lecture. Um, we will test this code on next Monday. So I, I will try to preserve the code until Monday. And I can send you guys you know, all of this code by announcement so you have a copy of all the source code that we talked about today. Today's lab is, <clears throat> let me see. Okay, let me expose, show the um, lab activity. It is about stack operations. So this one actually has to do with what we talked about on Monday and not so much today. So I'm trying to stagger a little bit here because you know I, this will give you guys a little bit more time to understand and let the material sink in before you get a lab activity on the same material. So the um, access code of the lab is LIFO, last in, first out. And it's a really easy one, um, you know, yeah, this one is pretty simple. I think there are only like four questions and three are multiple choice. One actually involves a little bit of experimentation. So, you know, I would use this time to try to kind of get used to the tools, especially the last question, you know, requires that you have to track down how much space on the stack has been used, okay? So you can use the tool that I was using earlier today. You can also just track one of the registers and figure out the answer. But um, it's up to you, okay? You guys can decide how you want to do it. But there's enough time in this lab probably to experiment with all the different tools. All right, so you guys go ahead and get started with your lab. I get a, I'll go get a little bit of a drink and then I'll be back. Non-alcoholic stuff, of course. Because when people say, I'm gonna go get a, something to drink, you know, sometimes it's implied <laughs> that it's alcoholic. If I drink something alcoholic at this time, I won't be able to drive home at three. Yeah, because I cannot process alcohol at all. All right, so I'll leave you guys at, with this and go get water, water. <clears throat> I forgot to turn off the recorder so I can upload all this stuff.